there are people that are suffering from the effect of climate change right now there are people that are being forced to migrate and their voices aren't being listened to their voices are being completely ignored by international decision makers there's always a lot of talk about climate change a lot of meetings about it but rarely do we see any concrete action we oftentimes hear how much money this or that solution will cost us what we do not hear so often is what are the costs of inaction we often live in a fantasy where we think that we, all we need is a text in international law and that it would solve the problem on the ground. It is often thought that people who move because of climate change are not entitled to any kind of protection as, as if there was a kind of blank or void in international law with regard to their protection. Uh, to many extent, it is true that these people are not adequately or sufficiently protected. But that's not to say that there are no protections at all that they could rely on. Provisions in environmental law, in humanitarian law, but also the guiding principles on internal displacement can often apply uh, to many cases of displacement related to climate change. And these guiding principles were adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1998. I should also mention an initiative uh, that was launched in 2012, which is called the Nansen Initiative. And the goal of the initiative was really to try and to foster the protection and the rights of those displaced across borders by disasters. And this initiative has led to the creation of a new international organization called the Platform on Disaster Displacement, PDD, which was launched in 2016 with the goal of supervising and assisting governments in implementing this protection agenda. On a regional level, there is the Kampala Convention, which is a convention of the states of the African Union, and which recognizes directly that people displaced by environmental changes should be protected. The Geneva Convention was negotiated in 1951 between the winning powers of the Second World War, and it only considers the political motives of migration. As a result of this, those displaced by environmental changes and the impacts of climate change are not really included in the Geneva Convention because it is a result of a political negotiations in the aftermath of World War II. Industrialized countries, countries of the global north, have a huge responsibility towards countries and populations in the global south where most of the impacts of climate change will, will materialize. So the question is how to frame this responsibility. I don't think that this can just be a legal responsibility. That's also a kind of economic responsibility of contributing to adaptation funds and programs. And this is really what the negotiations on climate change are trying to frame. The focus of the international community should really be around how we fundamentally change our systems. Because piecemeal, small, slow changes just aren't going to be enough. There is no climate justice without social justice. There's no climate justice without environmental or energy justice. And definitely there's no you know, uh, social or climate justice without uh, historical justice. I think that the tipping points for countries to meaningfully address this is not related to climate impacts or to the level of temperature or even to the level of displacement and migration. I think the tipping point is a matter of political communication. It is the moment when they realize that it's actually in their best interest to anticipate and organize these migration rather than try to resist them. Countries and governments will only apply and implement international law if it fits their national policies and priorities. When we talk about the role and responsibilities of governments towards climate change and migration, we're often inclined to put this in a framework of responsibility. Uh, the problem is that such a framework is not likely to yield meaningful results and will often turn into finger pointing. Whereas if we were to shift to another framework based on cooperation, based not on obligation, but on what states can do on their capacities, then we are likely to get more productive results. <laughs>